I am genetically an obese person. Now, my patients often say to me when we're talking about weight, well, you know, you're clearly one of the lucky ones. You're naturally a slim person. I'm one of the very few people who can tell you that I'm absolutely not. I work on a TV show called Embarrassing Bodies, and part of that show involved me being tested for different things. One of the tests I had last year was for 12 of the most commonly known genes linked to obesity. And, I'm afraid to tell you, I pretty much have a full house. One of the other tests I had was I had my gut flora analysed. Now, gut flora are the trillions of bacteria that live in our intestines. We need them. They're good bacteria that help us digest our food and extract nutrients from it. And they fall into two main families. One family is significantly more efficient at extracting energy from our food. And we all have different portions. In fact, there's quite a lot of research going on at the moment looking at overweight people and thinking if we could in some way manipulate their gut flora and give them more of the inefficient bacteria, could we help them lose weight? Well, I've had my flora analysed and I have 98% of the family that are more efficient at extracting energy from our food. So, there we have it. I am genetically and biologically predestined to be obese. But I'm not. Why am I not? Well, actually, those results don't really surprise me because I have always been aware, if I go on holiday with friends, that I put on weight really easily. And it's a real pain in the neck, but I have to work really hard at maintaining a healthy body mass index. I know after Christmas, after a holiday, I've got to really rein it in. So why am I telling you that? Well, I believe that fat is actually going to threaten health services across the Western world. Here in the UK, we have a free health service, our national health service. I'm very proud to work in it, and I think we're all very, pr very proud and very fond of her. Actually, I sometimes refer to the NHS as mum. For most of us living and born in the UK today, actually, she's always been around. She may not be perfect, and you might even sometimes feel that she lets you down but she has your best interests at heart. And one thing is for sure, when she's gone, you're going to really miss her. So let's talk about fat. Here is a pound of fat. Okay, a pound of fat equates to 3,500 calories. Any of you in the audience who have tried to lose weight in the past will have been told, if you can restrict your calorific intake by 500 calories a day, you will lose a pound a week. The problem is, the opposite is true as well. And if you overeat by 500 calories a day, you're going to gain a pound in a week. And actually, that's surprisingly easy to do. So, the average woman in the Western world probably needs around 2,000 calories a day, and the average guy needs 2,500 calories a day. You spread that usually between three meals. Now, supposing I did that, I had my 2,000 calories a day, but then perhaps mid-morning I have a latte and one or two shortbread fingers, and then on my way home I have a fizzy drink. I wouldn't feel that I was being particularly overindulgent, but that would actually be an extra 500 calories a day. And if I did that every day for a week, I'd gain a pound. If I did that every day for a year, I would gain three and a half stone. That would take me from a healthy body mass index today of 20 to a body mass index of 29. That wouldn't just make me clinically overweight, it would make me verging on clinically obese in just one year. The problem is, it's all too easy to do. We live in a society today in the Western world where food is readily available. Portion sizes have rocketed. So I know that a bar of chocolate when I was small was this size. Today, it's significantly bigger. The subliminal message there is that actually that's a perfectly appropriate amount of food to have as a snack. It's not. We're also far more sedentary today than we used to be. Experts reckon that only 20% of British adults are actually achieving the recommended levels of exercise of just half an hour, five times a week. Let's just 
turn back the clock a moment. I've just told you that British women need around 2,000 calories a day. In Victorian times, we didn't have washing machines, tumble dryers, hoovers, dishwashers, cars. The average Victorian woman probably needed nearer 4,000 calories a day. And she didn't get them from fast food and processed food, she got them from a much healthier source. So, I've told you that we're all getting bigger, and I've told you why. It's incredibly easy. Does it matter? Well, I'm afraid it does. And the reason it matters is diabetes. In the UK today, there are 3.2 million diabetics. 90% of those are type 2 diabetics. And I think we need to differentiate here, actually, because the two conditions are very different. Type 1 diabetes is a condition where you develop antibodies to your own pancreas. You need insulin for life. It is not a lifestyle illness. Type 2 diabetes, 90%, remember, of those diabetics are type 2, is almost always, not always, but almost always, linked to being overweight and having an unhealthy lifestyle. On top of that, there are 630,000 people in the UK today, some may even be in this auditorium, who have type 2 diabetes and they don't yet know. On top of that, there are 11.5 million people in Britain who are at risk of type 2 diabetes. And I know that some of you are here today. Now, those statistics probably scare me a lot more than they scare most of you, because I know what we're spending in the NHS on diabetes care. I'm just going to ask a couple of you. Can you just hazard a guess for me what you think we might spend? A day, a week, a year? Four billion a year. Yeah? OK. I'm going to tell you, actually, you can double that and some. We spend a million pounds an hour, a million pounds an hour, every single hour on the NHS. Now, experts tell us that we are currently making new diagnoses of type 2 diabetes 400 times a day. And if we continue at that rate, by 2025, there will be 5 million or more type 2 diabetics in the UK. Now, you don't need to be a business person or a mathematician to work out that if the NHS is struggling financially today, and we all know it is, that actually, if we don't do something about that, our NHS could be facing bankruptcy within our lifetime. I think one of the problems is we've all become a bit complacent. So we've all got bigger, we've got used to being bigger. I'm, I look back on my school days, and I remember there was one girl in my class who was overweight. Um, I don't remember her being bullied, but when I look back on it now, I think actually that must have been a fairly miserable, lonely place to be. She was always the last one to be picked for the netball team or the rounders team. Today, we look at classes, and actually there are lots of overweight kids in our classes. It's become the norm. And actually, I've got to admit that for me, it's become the norm too. I mean, sometimes I go to weigh and measure people with my GP hat on, and I'm surprised that they're not perhaps a little bit overweight. They are clinically obese. And that's because we've all shifted our radar. We've got used to looking at a bigger frame of person. But I also think it's more important than that. Because type 2 diabetes is so ubiquitous, everybody knows somebody with type 2 diabetes. And actually, they might look quite healthy. They might look fine, and they seem great. So does it really matter? The truth of the matter is that by the time you're diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, at least half of those people will already have complications. And we're talking really serious complications. I think sometimes there's almost a feeling that type 2 diabetes is a mild form of diabetes. It's not such an important problem. That's just so not the case. We're talking about really serious complications of this condition. Heart disease, heart attacks, strokes, kidney disease, meaning you need dialysis, blindness. Diabetes 
is the leading cause of visual loss in working age people here in the UK. Amputations. A hundred people will lose a limb today because of diabetes. And that happens every day of the year. So, that's the bad news. <laughs> what on earth are you going to say can possibly be the good news? Well, I think the good news is that we can turn the tide. And we can start that right here. Now, some of you, when you came into the auditorium this morning, will have noticed that you had a tape measure on your chair. I'm going to, in a moment, I'm going to ask those of you with tape measures to stand up. Before I do that, I'm going to tell you where your waist is, because I'm going to ask you to measure your waist. Your waist is halfway between the bottom of your rib cage and the top of your hip. It is supposed to be the narrowest part of you. It may not be. And as you can see, I have met lots of people wearing beautifully fitted 34-inch waist trousers that fit snugly below a perfectly formed 44-inch belly. <laughs> so, if I could ask you, those of you who have a tape measure that can, if you'd stand up for me, and whilst you measure your waists, I'm going to give you a few numbers, and I'd really like everybody in this auditorium to take these numbers home. Ladies, you should have a waist less than 32 inches. That's 80 centimetres. Gentlemen, you should have a waist less than 37 inches. That's 94 centimetres. Actually, if you're an Asian gentleman, because genetically Asian people are predisposed to type 2 diabetes, your waist should be less than 35 inches or 88 centimetres. So if I can ask all of you that have measured your waist to sit down. I was at this point actually going to say, could I ask all of those of you with a healthy waistline to sit down and leave those of you with an unhealthy waistline standing up? But I thought that was probably a little unfair. What I am going to do is I'm going to ask all of those of you who are now thinking, thank goodness she didn't go with plan A. I'd like you to do three things for me. I'd like you to take those tape measures home and get everybody that you know to measure their waists. Let's get the whole nation measuring our waists. And I'd like you, if, you were, if you're one of those people that would have been standing up, I'd like you to make an appointment to see your practice nurse and take a sample of urine with you to be tested for diabetes. I hope you're not one of the 630,000 people in this country with type 2 diabetes who don't yet know. But I know that you are one of the 11 and a half million people who are at risk. And the final thing I'm going to ask you to do, and actually I'm going to surprise you now because I'm not going to ask you to go on a diet. Actually, I'm not a fan of diets. I think by definition, if you go on a diet, at some point you're going to come off it. I'm not even going to ask you to give up your favorite bar of chocolate for life or to promise yourself that you will never have another takeaway because I also believe there's no such thing as an unhealthy food, but there are plenty of unhealthy living plans. What I am going to ask you to do is to look at your lifestyle and see what you could do, small changes, that maybe you could still be doing this time next year. So it might be get off the bus or stop early. It might be use the stairs rather than lift at work. It might be only have that bar of chocolate on a Friday. It might be only have the occasional takeaway. If you can do that, you will have a longer and healthier life. If we can all do that, we have the capability to save our beloved NHS. Thank you very much for listening. Have a good day.